Welcome to Sunday. We have a very exciting uh, time today because I'm going to get into some detail about how stories are written. Specifically, uh, Marie's sculpture, since I posted that picture and there were a lot of questions about that. Now, I know I've talked about that before, uh, but we will get into it. Hello, Gil. Welcome to our Sunday Hangout. Uh, I am Tom Caltabiano, sharing with you stories about Everybody Loves Raymond, a little bit uh, inside, uh, a lot inside, since you guys who are big fans of the show know the As Broadcast show probably uh, uh, better than I do. So I want to, uh, hello, Leo, hello. Uh, I will, I, I, this will be an abbreviated show. I have to leave uh, in about 35 minutes, but we will answer a lot of questions, and I, of course, will be back next week uh, with a guest. But uh, let's get into Maurice's sculpture. I'm going to uh, plug in. Hello, Paula. I'm... There we go. Plugging in my microphone. Uh, and I assume you can all hear me. Hello, Karen. In Plymouth, England, I hope. Still. Hello, Lee. Hello, everybody. Uh, yes, Teresa, those inside stories uh, change the way you look at the episodes. Yeah, uh, it's interesting to know uh, uh, what went down uh, behind the scenes, and I do wish uh, that, and I've shared this before, uh, I do wish that I knew a lot more uh, of the inside stories of some of my other favorite episodes. Uh, yes, Jane, you don't get... The sculpture, Marie's sculpture episode. Hello, Waterford, uh, Ireland. You don't get Marie's sculpture episode in England. Uh, and is that because I think they show it in the morning there? Even though um, one of Phil's uh, goals was to, no matter what subject was covered, to make it family friendly. So if you know, uh, if you notice, uh, it's very, very, very delicately um, uh, uh, phrased when they're talking about the sculpture. So, uh, and, and other subjects on the show, because uh, Phil and Ray both wanted it to be a very family-friendly show. Uh, all right, so there were some questions about where the sculpture came, uh, came from. Hello, Malcolm. Uh, the story, etc. So, in the scheme of things, on Everybody Loves Raymond, when you wrote an episode, you would come into the writer's room with hopefully a story that um, happened to you in real life. So when Marie's sculpture happened, uh, it, it was kicked off by Jennifer Crittenden, who uh, her mother took an abstract sculpting class and gave her a sculpture. And Jennifer came in to the writer's room and told this story. And she said, it looks exactly uh, like a female part, and I really don't want it in my house. So Phil said, okay, let's great, funny story, let's do that story. So just to slow it down, when we would tell the story in the writer's room, a lot of times you didn't necessarily come in and say, oh, I have a great story idea. Sometimes you would, but sometimes it was so emotionally connected that you couldn't see it. So, for example, Phil, who let's call him a pretty good expert on Everybody Loves Raymond, had the toaster happen to him uh, in real life. But he was so angry at his parents that he didn't see it as an episode when it first happened. So, uh, when, when Jennifer came in, uh, she told the story, and Phil's like, okay, that can be a story. That's a funny potential story. So Phil would say, put it on the board, which meant write it on a dry erase board, write the story. So it might say the sculpture or something like that. So Phil knew that he grew up in uh, upstate New York. Now, for those of you that know the United States and know New York, really upstate New York is Rochester, Buffalo, way up north. But when you're in Manhattan, you know, you're going to Rockland County, for example, seems far away. In fact, about 30 minutes or 40 minutes 
uh, or 25 miles away from Manhattan is Rockland County. In Rockland County, there is a courthouse, and in front of that courthouse is a sculpture. So if you look that up, and I know I've posted about this before and we've talked about this before, but it's such a popular episode. Phil uh, called his parents and said, can you go now? This is now probably 1999, 2000 maybe. So there's no everybody has a cell phone and takes a picture. Uh, and I don't know the state of the Internet then. So Phil calls his parents up and says to them, can you please take a picture of the vagina sculpture? And so that I'll let Phil tell that the next time he joins the exchange he has with his parents. So they do that, though. They, they, he ultimately gets a picture of that. He sends uh, that to our props department. Now, there was a very funny moment in the writer's room where Phil is talking to uh, the props department, and he's saying, we need, I'm paraphrasing him, it has to be giant, like the sculpture, because I think, uh, uh, I don't remember exactly, but I thought the, the, the sculpture that Jen's mother was just, you know, this big. And so Phil was like, unless, we, unless it's a giant sculpture, we are missing a lot of comedy. So that was kind of the, uh, the morphing of what was given to Jen by her mother to Phil, knowing this statue that exists. And if you guys go online and you Google that statue, you will be able to see a, a picture of it. And I think it used to be on the steps of the courthouse, and now it's around the side of the of the courthouse so um uh that but that speaks to the writing process because uh there is no uh at least on how it worked on everyone's raymond and uh, by the way just as a side note i was going to have uh, a friend of mine wrote on friends uh and he writes on mom now which is the show that's on cbs with allison janney uh uh, and I was going to have him as a guest to talk about how they wrote on Friends and how they write on Mom. If you guys are interested, give me a thumbs up on that. A writer on Friends for the first six season, uh, and then a writer on uh, Mom and many other things uh, in between. But on on Raymond, you would have this story idea, and there was no story uh, idea that you know Phil has an idea. He writes, uh, and Phil is the best example because. He's the boss. So almost everything gets in that Phil writes. So there is, though, no episode that was written that didn't have input from other writers. So uh, along the way, since it's a five-day process, you would have uh, um, a chance to add jokes or tweak a script all of those five days. But even before then, when you're just breaking the story, breaking the story means trying to figure out what is the story of the show, you would come up with an outline, a two-pager is what Phil called it, what we called it. So that was an outline of here's a paragraph of everything that happens in each scene. Marie comes in and gives a sculpture, you know, it, and that kicks off in, in, in script writing. It's the inciting incident. So uh, that kicks it off. So the script. Uh, the two-pager has just a summary. No dialogue. Phil doesn't want to see dialogue. He doesn't want to see your clever jokes. He just wants to hear, this happens in this, sh in this scene, this happens in this scene, this happens in this scene. And you want for, if you're into screenwriting or would like to learn about it, if you uh, think about it in these terms, every character should have some emotional turn in a scene. So it, it, they change. So... Uh, if you have a bunch of scenes and, and Ray's angry at the beginning of this first scene and he's angry at the beginning of the second scene and he's angry at the beginning of the third, it's just a, 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 for the viewer, it's, it's a monotonous and not rewarding thing. So that's a subtle thing that's happening within the scene to the characters. So you have this two-pager and then you, you work it out and then you finish it and that goes back into the writer's room. And once that is back in the writer's room, now all the writers read that two-pager and they go, knowing that they're going to have to do the same thing for scripts throughout the year, they'll sit there and go, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't understand. Why is Deborah not this way? or what? And so you have a chance to give notes and have a conversation. 
And that changes the two-pager. So now by the time that two-pager is done and you go off to write the script, it's pretty well tweaked. Then the writer, in this case, in, it was Raymond, this, uh, y y you would write the first draft. You give it to Phil. After writing the first draft, Phil gives you notes, and he'll, he'll go through the script and go, you know, check marks where there's a laugh, whatever, and then he'll write in, ah, I don't buy Frank doing this, a, a bunch of notes. You go back, rewrite, tweaking the script. And the one thing, for those of you that want to write, one thing that Phil said very clearly is what separates people who aren't going to make it from people who do make it, for the most part, is your ability to take notes on a script. Because, especially in the case of Evers Raymond, the script always got better. And the, uh, we even did the article uh, uh, episode where Andy doesn't even want notes. That's the default position of people that write a script the first time. They're like, this is comedy gold. This, help, this will win an Emmy. Just shoot it as is. And that never happens on a network sitcom. It just doesn't. Uh, you always, it's always an iterative process. So once you've addressed Phil's notes, now every writer gets your script and goes right through the script. You go through the script, page one, anybody, anything, page two. So every single script, you go through every single page. That's before we even get to the table read that kicks off the week, the production week. So now, once you have the production week starting, you have the table read, you go back and if something that didn't get last, you take it out or you tweak it, and every single uh, day of rehearsal and watching, that script can change up to the second or third take live in front of the audience. So I hope that... Uh, clears up a little bit of uh, how the sculpture came about, how a script is written, and all the iterative process. Uh, all right, so it looks like you want a Friends writer to talk about what was it like to write on Friends for the first six years. All right, let me just scroll back because I was talking. Let's go back and look at some questions here. Hello, hello, hello. Those are all greetings. Let's see if there's... Now, I want to talk about stand-ins uh, a little bit. Hello, everybody. Scrolling through questions. Hello again. Uh, again, this is Tom Caltabiano. is a writer on Eros Raymond for all nine years. Hello in Arizona. Um, yes, only have seen each a few dozen times. That is funny. Yes. Where is the actual sculpture now? Okay. So, uh, I want to get our props person on to talk about props. Every prop that's significant in a show, there is there are two of them. So, uh, and sometimes there's three of them. You cannot have, uh, so I guess unless it's a gigantic, it's a, we've built a suspension bridge. They may not build two of those. But every prop, they have to have two copies of. They must, because if you have to stop production because something broke, on the one prop, like if you only had one canister and somebody misplaced it, and now you have a crew of 130 people standing around going, did anybody see the canister? So the, the um, sculpture, there were two of them. And after the show was <laughs> filmed, we never saw the sculpture again. Then, when Everybody's Raymond was ending, all of a sudden, the sculpture one day was in the middle of the stage in front of the couch in the living room. I'll post a picture of me standing next to the sculpture. Uh, one of the sculptures Doris Roberts took. I never, I'd been to Doris Roberts uh, a, a decent amount of times. I never saw the sculpture. I don't know where she kept it. It's a probably six feet tall. So it's not something that you hide easily. And then this is a great mystery. Who has that second sculpture? Now, uh, some people speculated that Ray had it. Ray does not have the sculpture. His wife has too neat of a house to have a six-foot sculpture like that. Um, uh, so I'll find out. Uh, my suspicion is maybe Donna Stamps, who was the head of our... Um, uh, uh, what was she? Set dressing, I guess you would call it. Uh, I, I, but I don't know. That is a mystery that is unsolved. I'll see if I can find out. 
yes, you want to talk to Phil. You want to see Phil and Monica talk about the can opener. I will see if I can get them to join. Uh, T-C-E Tori. Or T Chitore. One of the best episodes, and you say that every week. That is funny because there are a lot. You forget the episodes. Then when I post a photo, you uh, chances are uh, you're you're in uh, very good company because a lot of people said, "Hello, Joe, Hannesburg, South Africa. What time is it there? And where do you see the show, Steffi? Dot N S. Um." Look at these. A few season one, you can see the microphone from above. Yes. Uh, it's funny that people are intrigued by that. So the and, – and I'll see if I can have what's a, known as a boom operator. Boom operator, uh, their microphone has a little piece of white tape on it. So uh, when it's hanging in frame – and actually I have – this is not in use now, but here you go. There's a boom microphone for something else I'm doing. On the show, they have a white piece of tape. It's foam with a white piece of tape. And for those of you that are audio geeks, uh, they're Sennheiser MK, uh, is it an MKH416? They have that foam and they're looking on a little, now for then, keep in mind, this is 1996, 97. They're looking at a little black and white monitor and they're cranking this giant uh, crane that has a boom, it's a boom arm, and so they have to make sure that they're not going into frame. So apparently, uh, and you guys, when you see that, let, let me know, write, write me, and I'll look for those in those episodes. All right, the only way to see the sculpture episode in London is on DVD, in England is on DVD. Interesting. Uh, the sex game, you don't get the sex game in England either. True. Uh, where there lot, go with the flow, babe. Were there lots of outtakes when filming Marie's sculpture? You know, I don't, I think when we first, by the time we got to show night, we had seen the sculpture now for a week, uh, but there wasn't, uh, uh, I don't remember specifically like people laughing more than usual. And also, uh, I think we've talked about this, you're burning time, money, everything. The network is very, very conscious about time uh, and money. And it's not like they're sitting over you with a whip, but you have to get the show out and you want the audience not to be exhausted. So uh, there are times when, you know, the, an actor would start laughing and they felt bad because they know that everybody's sitting there. There's, there's all these people watching and going, come on, get your line, get your line. Uh, hello, Mary from Melbourne saying hello. Hello, Mary. Chris Miro. Let's see. Leo. Leo, you have fantastic questions. How much say the network have on Marie's sculpture episode? Was he final as close? To, was the final closest to what Phil and the writers wanted? I, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm going to have to ask Phil. I don't remember that being a, uh, in any way, uh, now, uh, having problems with the network, giving too many notes about how the sculpture should look, etc., I will say this, that was, I think, season five. Do you guys know what season that was? Five or six? Somewhere in there. At that point, the show was a hit. The first season, I think it was Steve Scrovan, pitched a show. Uh, pitching, it just means this is your story idea that you would like to do. Uh, where Frank hands out condoms. So that was the first season. And the network said, no, you can't do that. And then they ended up doing it, uh, I think, season three. Uh, there was, yes, Bobby, what was used in the table read for the sculpture? I don't remember. That's a great question. I don't remember if the sculpture was present in the table read. I, you know, I, I'm gonna have to go back and look at my photos. I don't think it was. I think we pretended just like you have to pretend with everything else in the table read. Almost never did you have a prop at a table read, like the canister, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't remember ever there being a prop at a table read, but that would have been a that would have been a prop that you hard. It's hard to miss. Go with the flow, babe. I so love that you're doing Q and A's on here. Uh, you're fascinated. Great. Uh, it's too hard. We're simple folk. Great. Uh, by the way, the one of the women that plays the nun that comes over to get the sculpture is also a guest star on uh, um, Mom. Okay, 
T C E Tori. Is that by the way, I have to talk to Kim. Kim, are you watching? Kim who worked on the show. There are three sculptures. Doris had one. Interesting. Uh let's see. What uh, scrolling down, great questions. Great questions. Hello. Um did they have to get permission from the courthouse to film it? No. Good question, Leo. Yes, two nuns were hilarious. And I think that's hello hello uh uh Trish. Um that's uh they didn't you know it's it's no the short answer is no because you're allowed to uh uh it's a very good question because when we have Rhonda the props person on uh they don't like to have like for example a name if they said oh uh uh Teresa we want to use her name Teresa uh, uh, and we give her, you know, the last name. So one of my friend's name that I put in the show is Frank Pecarella, but we had to change it to Chuck Pecarella because Frank, uh, Frank Barone is the same first name. They run that name. So if there's 20 Frank Pecarellas, then it's no problem. If there's only one in the world with that name, they'll come back and say you can't use that name because that person could uh, sue you because they're like, hey, that's representing... Uh, uh, me. So, and then with the props, uh, they won't, you know, that gets into uh, giving away free advertising. So you'll see, I don't think I have one around here, you'll see generic cola can, uh, which I got from my props uh, person, because they don't want to give free advertising to Coca-Cola, for example. So, uh, um, yeah, we need a giant sculpture. Yes, on stage. All right, I'm scrolling through. Hello, everybody. Still waiting for the can opener story from Phil and Monica. Yes, family mom forever. We did talk about it a little, but I will make sure that Phil and Monica uh, are here and talk the entire time. Um, Pumpernickel, oh yeah, fudge bar. Uh, how do you write for the length of the scene? Is the scene a prescribed length? Heidi Bloom, 19. Great question. How do you write for the length of the scene? So what you're trying to do is tell the story. And so you figure out what scene, what, what has to come out in that scene. So you, when you're breaking the story and going, okay, we need this scene, we need this scene, we need this scene, it's, it's not that it writes itself, but you know here's what has to go down in this scene. And that kind of dictates what happens. So... Uh, you won't, you know, the, you'll have a big scene that might be six pages uh, because that much has to come out. And a lot of time that's what's called the block comedy scene where it's a big, you know, climactic scene like the nuns come over. That, that for example, uh, is a big scene. So there's no set thing like, okay, your first scene should be two pages. Your second scene should be three pages. There's nothing like that. It's what organically helps tell that story. And... A Raymond script is about 40 pages. Ray would speak slowly. And so our, our, our scripts were generally shorter um, than, than a lot of other scripts. It'll be cur I'll be very curious when we talk to Adam, uh, who wrote on Friends. Uh, Wendell Poons. Hello, Wendell Poons. I'm way behind the questions. Let me scroll. Holy moly. Okay. Let me try and get back to that. If I didn't answer your question... Go back and um, oh, sorry, just write it again. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so Wendell Poons, did I ever get a, a, a two pager? No, I never got it rejected. What you want is if the initial story has uh, uh, potential. In other words, you have the the sculpture thing just seems like comedy gold right off the bat. You're like, okay, that forget the story, forget anything. That idea that Marie takes this class and presents this giant statue, you'll go, okay, we have to build a story about, around, around that. So once that happens, it's already like, okay, let's make this story work. So do you get, yes, do you get in your two-pager where you go, I don't think this scene works? Yes. But it's never like, oh, this is Marie's sculpture idea? No, nope, your two-pager doesn't work. Let's get rid of the story idea. That, that, that never happened. Once a story... And I think this, you know this in your own life, but one of the story ideas that 
really everybody instantly got heated was talking about the lateness episode being late and i think that was a steve scrovan uh episode and so when he was talking about his having to wait for his wife uh everybody in the writer room came alive and was like yeah so we knew it was a heated topic so you kind of know that's the target of this is a really rich area versus uh i remember the first season we stayed on a saturday and we were trying to break a story about discipline, disciplining your children. And it just seemed so laborious and nobody was, n- nothing seemed to be coming out. Versus when Scrovan was talking about lateness, everyone was like, yes, this, this, this. And then, uh, just talking about the collaborative process, uh, it was Aaron Shore, whose friend's father was the AIS, who said, ass in seat. And so we're like, oh, that's a great thing. So. Uh, um, just going back, you're generally, once your two-pager got, once you got to the two-pager level, it didn't get thrown out, but it filled in like a scene, you would have to rewrite it. Um, yes, Family Mom Forever, The Big Fork and Spoon. How great is The Big Fork and Spoon? Now, I think that, this we have to talk to Donna Stamps, I think, about, who is set, set uh, dressing. Uh, and again, Kim, if you're watching... Uh, I know I've said this before, with a lot of people aren't on Instagram. So I want to talk to everybody, but a lot of them aren't on Instagram. So the Big Fork and Spoon, I think, was just decoration there. And then that got into the baggage episode, which if you go back and look through Tucker's thing, he has the Big Fork and Spoon, uh, which I want to... uh, People have asked about me selling my photos, if they can buy any of my photos. And I don't have a site for them, but I think I will. Let me know if you want. But the Big Fork and Spoon... That is an iconic uh, image. Um, Okay, great. My wife bought me an apron that says, don't let a suitcase full of cheese be your big fork and spoon. Yes. I will have to post the photo. I have the the photo of them rehearsing that scene, and I have the uh, in the makeup room and a uh, a photo of them actually on the set, and then the night of the... um, uh, uh, filming. Okay. Don Donnell. Is it Donnell? 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 Uh, do you enjoy me mispronouncing your name? After that process, how do you determine who gets the writing credit? Okay. Great question. Uh, the person that pitches the story initially gets the writing credit. So even if, in that lightness example, uh, even if Aaron Shore just has the AIS idea, um, that it, it's part of the, uh, the, the, it becomes part of the script, but you don't break it down. Now, Phil was a very democratic, uh, uh, um, showrunner is the term. There are shows where the showrunner took credit and put his name on every script or most of the scripts and Phil was not that way. So you would often benefit from other people's ideas because the same thing, they're going to benefit from your ideas. So it all is going to work out. Uh, but the person that comes in with the initial story idea is who gets their name on the script. But that is not the case in a lot of shows. Hello, United Kingdom, Victor, Jim, Buddy, Heidi Bloom. Uh, do you keep props in case of a, a reboot? Uh, I don't. Th- uh, yes, sorry. I don't. I have some props. I have. I just realized I have the bread. The I'll, I'll show it. I think I mentioned before the bread. Uh, the bread box that's on top of the refrigerator, a brown uh, uh, bread box. Um, my four boys won. Is there any place where you can go to to view the props? I don't think so. Uh, 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 love the behind scenes picture of information. Thank you, family mom. Uh, I know Phil has. If you go back, you saw me doing this from Phil's uh, guest house where Frank and Marie's table is, and I think Ray. I forget what Ray has. I think Ray has Frank and Marie's chair. Uh, so, but uh, is stuff stored for uh, future use? No. There is no like, okay, CBS has a big warehouse of Everett's Raymond in case there's a reboot. So, Family Mom Forever, did they really use stinky cheese? I forget what cheese they use. I'll have to ask. I don't remember. Uh, where's the... T- <laughs> Where's the turkey? That's funny. Where's the turkey that Deborah threw into the oven? Yeah. Um, 
Jennifer did not win an Emmy for the episode. Uh, would be would be amazing to track down some of those props. Yes, uh, Ray's manager has a lot of the props. Uh, was there any scene? Hello, Donet. Any scene from the run of the show that ran afoul of the censors that you had to fight for? No, uh, there was not. And we are unlike Friends or Seinfeld. Uh, uh, it, it was a pretty straight ahead show so there wasn't really any and b again before you get to film the show it's it's been seen by the network so the network has someone assigned to the show called a current executive there's development executives and then there's current executives so the cur cbs current executive sees the script they're supposed to read the script which they do and they're supposed to say wait you have a giant sculpture of a lady's private parts hmm I'm gonna have to see that, you know. So they'll they'll so you don't get to show night without a lot of people seeing everybody. Um, it's always funny to watch the outtakes and see Ray and Patty joking each other about messing up and being Emmy winners. Yeah, uh, well, actually, Patty, thank goodness for Patty because we weren't nominated for any Emmys, and Patty got nominated. So the first season, I think, no Emmy nominations. Second season, no I mean, no Emmy nominations. So we just assumed we'll never be nominated for an Emmy. And then Patty got nominated, and I can't remember if she won that first year. But there is a scene, if you go on YouTube and you look it up, you'll see Ray going, that's your line, Emmy winner. Because it was such a big thrill that she won an Emmy. Uh, let's see. Extras are fake talking, just pretending. Yes. I guess I missed a question there, Bobby. Have always wondered about notes given to extras. If the scene calls from talking to each other, are they giving suggestions of what they say, or do they wing it on their own? Yeah, well, a lot of times also they're just supposed to say walla walla. They they literally just say walla walla, walla walla, walla walla walla. And so it becomes non, because what you don't want, and this is uh, in psychology, it's called the cocktail effect. So if you're in a cocktail party, crowded cocktail party, and you hear either your name or a talk about sex or something, your ear will pick it up. So they want to prevent that from happening. Uh Whose dog ran through the house when Marie backed into the house? Did a dog run through the house? I can't, I don't remember. Uh, were the kids' parents always required to be on set? No, but there was a teacher, Gina. Uh, there was a teacher on set. So there was always a chaperone as well as a teacher, I think. Uh, yeah, so the t I think they deliberately don't want parents of actors on the set. All right, let's look through. Ginger Ale was very popular, Family Mom Forever, because Ray Romano in real life loved ginger ale, and Canada Dry sent a bunch of ginger ale, and so that is why. Uh, DW, thanks for wearing the blue shirt so I can read the comments. Yeah, uh, I hope you can read them better. Here we go. Let me tip it down <laughs> so you see more shirt. Okay, uh, because that's what Ray drinks, yes, in real life. And then Ray eventually... Uh, oh, I see. You guys are beating me to answering the questions, and you're telling the truth. Do storylines like the sculpture have to fit the character? Me was always uh, about art, music, and learning French, so it was believable. Yes, uh, yes. So that's an excellent question, uh, Heidi Bloom, 19. So uh, where's 1 through 17 of the Heidi Bloom? They fail would flag something. Because you, as an audience member, know when you're watching. Now, on Raymond, nothing really got through that was out of character. There were a few things that we did make mistakes on. Uh, like, I think we've talked about this, where Robert blows the surprise for the surprise party, and it just feels not like Robert's character. But uh, uh, Phil would write in your script, this doesn't sound like Frank. This doesn't say, you know what I mean? Like, so he was very protective. And you had nine people or seven people, depending on the year, in the room going, ah, it just doesn't feel like Marie would do that. And that happens early on. Um, oh, yes. Thank you, Wendell Poons. I am late again. Okay. Uh, what does a story editor do as opposed to a writer? Paula. Paula. Uh, great question. Uh, Karen. Uh, Ray is not on social media. He will never be on social media. Mark my words. Um, what does a... St okay, so Paula, excellent question. So, uh, nothing. A story editor does nothing different than a writer. 
So these are Writers Guild rules. So you start as a staff writer. You get no credit. Staff writer, I can't remember all the titles, but it's like staff writer, story editor, executive story editor, um, uh, co-producer, producer, supervising producer, co-EP, EP. They all, for the most part, do every single thing the same. You're just a, not just a writer, but you're writing. So there is no, okay, you're the story editor. You're responsible for editing these stories. It's literally just a matter of what is your Writers Guild title, and by dint of that title, you get more money. Okay, love the show. Yes, 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 a ran, oh, a dog ran through the house. I'm going to have to watch that. I have not seen that in a, in a, in a, in a while. Um, uh, how did you tangle Deborah's hair with the curling iron? Uh, yes, great question, Gina. That was, uh, I asked Ralph uh, Avalos, who was the hair person, and he tied it into her hair using some thin thread. Uh, yeah, and I'm hoping to have, do you guys want to hear from the hair people and the makeup people? Would that interest you if I could get them to join hair and makeup uh, and also um, the props people, uh, everybody. All right, one or two last questions. Let me scroll back. Thank you, everybody. And I didn't even get to stand-ins. So uh, I think stand-ins are a little confusing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to post a couple of pictures of stand-ins. And the succinct way to put it is when you're making a production, you have the main actors, you have the cast of Raymond. But there's a lot of excruciatingly long lighting and positioning and figuring things out where you need a person who's about the same height and complexion, hopefully, of the star to stand in for the star. So uh, you will hear on the set, okay, uh, second team are the stand-ins. So the second team is there. There's someone overhead adjusting the lights. They're standing there for... 10 minutes, 15 minutes maybe, the stand-in. And then, okay, can we bring in first team, please? Now Ray and the whole cast comes in. Everything has hopefully been worked out. They rehearse, they rehearse, and then they go back to the dressing room, and the second team comes in. I know that sounds simple, but when I post pictures, it seems to have uh, a lot of confusion. Uh, aside from the Italy episode, what was the most expensive scene to shoot? Um, I would say... Uh, yes, Bobby, I, I <laughs> probably some, I, I have an idea for toy props that I think, uh, I'll keep you posted because you guys are such great fans. Uh, aside from the other episode, what was the most expensive scene to shoot? That's very interesting. You have to exclude actors' salaries because Ray and others' salaries went up precipitously as the show got to. So excluding salaries, I would say probably the episode where they ran to the wall. And then running that bull on the back scene and then the engagement thing. Anytime you left the stage, I think it cost a little bit more money. Uh, so that was uh, a pretty expensive one. Uh, yes, you want a canister. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. The kids wanted to keep the dog that ran through the house. Thank you, Paula. I'll have to look at that. All right, I'm going to post. Yes, hair and makeup. Chris, Chris, Chrissy V., uh, hair people, makeup people. Okay, yes. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, I am late as usual. Um, Karen, I do watch the show when it's on. All right, I will see you guys next week. I will post, I'll uh, have a guest. I'll post pictures of some stand ins and the regular cast sitting in the exact same uh, position. And keep those questions coming. Thank you so much, and I will see you soon.